The Nine Years Podcast. Is it too early for Christmas songs? Good. Hello, and thank you for downloading the Nine Years Podcast. Still officially the number one AFC Wimbledon podcast, with more than double the amount of listeners than the average away turnout from Dagenham and Redbridge. We are the number one source of AFC Wimbledon-related audio content, and we ask you to keep us there by clicking the subscribe link on iTunes or YouTube and adding any of your comments about the show to our Facebook or Twitter pages at 9YRS Podcast. I'm Nick Draper, joined by Stuart Deacons for episode 18 of the show, which comes to you in a daze today as we recover from the rather miserable defeat to Dagenham on Tuesday night. A disappointing evening for sure, as disappointing, I would imagine, as meeting Nick Grimshaw or going to watch Watford. Someone who I'm sure was very disappointed on Tuesday was Boris Becker, who was served up a fault of a performance from our otherwise ace team as he attended King's Meadow, and I do apologise. I didn't think we were going to go down the puns route with this show, but I suppose once in 18 shows isn't too bad. Um, I didn't see him myself. I think Stu and I, we both know a few people that did, but Stu, have you ever met any other famous people at football matches or in life generally? Not that you like to name drop, I know. <laughs> um, no, not football, football stars. I, I was out in um, was I, an Albufera many years ago with a few good friends and Stephen Gerrard. It was just before, before going back, I think it was just before we played Germany in the 5-1 um, win in Munich, wasn't it? And yeah. um, it, we were in a bar in Albufera and he walked into a bar and my mate, who's a big Liverpool fan, <laughs> Did he wouldn't himself? believe <laughs> no, he wouldn't believe, my mate wouldn't believe, um, so my mate, it was actually Gary Saxby who comes on here, oh, yeah. wouldn't believe for a minute that um, he, Stephen Joe walked into the bar and then, um, yeah, it was quite gosmacked. And he was a good lad. Um, we, the next night he was in Lineker's bar. And um, the funny thing I remember is that he's, he basically went around saying that he would um, sign autographs and, you know, spend time with people for an hour and then he asked to be left alone after that, which people uh, really were quite good and honoured. But, the thing I remember is the amount of girls that went into this Lineker's bar and all you hear was Stephen Gerrard's mates in a Scouse accent going, I'm his mate, I'm his mate. <laughs> <laughs> and um, trying to get his leftovers and there was quite a lot of leftovers. What was he eating? Oh, sorry, I see what you're sorry. I see what you're sorry. <laughs> um, Stephen Gerrard's quite good, Stuart, I must admit. I must, I've got to be honest, my, I've met a few famous people in my time. Stephen Gerrard's pretty famous. I raise you Linda Barker. From off of Changing Rooms fame, who I once met on jury service randomly. Random world. That is a random world. Or Tony Blackburn. Bumped, bumped into him in, literally bumped into him in Luton, <laughs> the HMV in Luton, town centre. <laughs> Classy. Classy, yeah. And um, yeah, a couple of Big Brother contestants from years gone by. Vanessa, I think. Do you remember? I don't know if people know who this woman is. I only remember her because I bumped into her in Notting Hill a few years ago. You can't class anybody off that as famous, surely. No, maybe not. Do you know who I did meet once? Do you remember? Do you remember Mel? Well, I say remember. She's around now, Mel, but I can't pronounce her surname. She was of Mel and Sue, and she now does the Bake Off thing. Was she a Wimbledon fan? She was was a Wimbledon fan, or Um, is a Wimbledon fan? Or is apparently a Wimbledon fan. I never saw her at a Wimbledon game. I saw her once at a Wimbledon game, and it was randomly Bedfont away on a midweek Tuesday. I think in our first season of the CCL. In fact, were you with me at the time? You probably were. Probably was. I was just thinking out loud also, in terms of we talk about famous people, of course, we have an own Wimbledon fan in Marcus Mumford. Of course. Who, um, my fiance, I remember one time when she, when Marcus Mumford walked past her, he was, walk, she, he was walking past her in front of the Kemflo stand. And I remember getting a picture on my phone of her stalking him by a picture. And he walked, um, walked by in a cap. So, um, yeah, we have our own styles, don't we, as Wimbledon fans? This is true. We have a, a number, apparently a number of celebrity fans supporting AFC Wimbledon, if we consider John Green as well, kind of. Definitely. Um, yeah, not that I've met him. And MC Harvey used to play for us, don't forget. 21, is it 21 seconds? Yes. <laughs> yes, we've got there, 21 seconds. 21 seconds to go. 21 seconds to go. Sadly, that's no more time to go for our chat about celebrities. We have to move on, as today we'll be talking about um, games that have been played in extremely cold temperatures some famous goalkeeping errors and the best and worst 
away fans we've experienced in our time. But let's get this Dagenham game out of the way, Stu. In one word, it was painful. Your thoughts? Yeah, we've had a, we've had a tough tough week, haven't we, really? We went into... Um, we we'll sort of touch on Wickham as well quickly, but we obviously went after a late equaliser against the all falling over and probably the most professional team at killing a game off ever I've seen. And I've seen a few teams in my time. Um, we've got the equaliser against Wickham, uh, which gave us a point going into a what we all thought was a home banker against bottom of the table, Dagenham Redbridge. No goals in November. Nine points, bottom of the league, and um, we have to say we've we made hard work of it on Tuesday night, um, going down to a third goal of the season from Jamie Gerton, um, and um, yeah, it was it was disappointing. Um, as Neil Ardy, um loves, if you look at the stats across the game, all the stats are in our favour. They had two shots on goal, and one we helped in, so it was a disappointing night, Nick, wasn't it? It was Jamie Curiton, we sort of everyone was talking about him before kick off seeing whether he was on the team sheet or not. He was on the bench but then came on injury to their other centre forward, McClure, I think, very early on. Curiton comes on. Of course Curiton gets credited with the goal. Whether it was his goal or an own goal, I'm not sure. But to go back, Wickham, we got, as you say, that late equaliser. Adebayo Aziz in the right place at the right time as he has a knack of doing, and then he wasn't in the starting eleven on Tuesday night. Was that the wrong decision? In hindsight, yeah, I think it is. Um We've, the problem we've got at the moment is we've got four strikers who we're trying to place into two positions and at the moment it looks like Neil's trying to give more a fair chance you'd hope it would go on form I, I would argue that Bayo done well to keep his place um, for Tuesday night I thought Aziz come, when he you know, when he come on he'd done well he got the goal you would have thought he would have been on the start um, I was crying out for us to go and be brave and go over you know I said as we chatted before the game, just go 4-3-3, three, three. Let's just play caution to the win, let's play with pace. But we went really with, you look at the lineup. we went with our two normal women, Callum Candy, who I think is playing well, but I still I still feel it's a, it's a defender playing in a forward position. I don't really, I think we should be looking at possibly using someone else for that side. Um, we used George Frankham and with Bayo and Lyle Taylor up front and, um, I thought Bayer, I thought Bayer had a better game, um, but I, he's not hitting anywhere near the form that he did last year, and um, not surprisingly um, was taken off again as he was against Wickham. Um, so we are we are struggling. I think we should have gone brave. We didn't go, we didn't play with the tempo we needed to. Um, it reminded me a little bit of Forest Green Rovers. Dagenham were never going to come out and attack us. They they'd be stupid to do that because of their you know their record, and we probably would have. Um, bits them away, but we just seem to have this little bit of a Achilles heel at the moment. When teams come to ours to sit behind the ball, we've got a breakdown, say two banks of four. We just don't seem to have that cleverness or that nous at the moment to break these teams down. And we're getting, you know, respect is being you know passed to us um, in their formations and how teams are playing against us. But we need to really, really look at that and really be able to look at conquering. So I think a few more teams are going to do that at our place. Are we struggling in the midfield then? You mentioned the wingers and Kennedy playing up wide. We are short of numbers. Fitzpatrick's gone on loan. Bartram's still injured. Tom Beer, who can play wide, he's now gone out on loan as well. Is that an area we need to strengthen, bearing in mind that the loan window, I believe, is shutting as we speak? It is. Um, it'll be interesting to see what he does. We've obviously got Andy Bartram due back any time now. Um, yeah, we have loaned our kids out. We've loaned Fitzpatrick out to... Tunbridge Angels, um, Tom Beer's gone to Bishop Storford. Um, I think that's a little bit on to, to do with the, the lack of under-21 action I've had recently. Um, although, from Monday, we do actually start um, a run of three home three home games at Merston um, for the under-21s. I, I do feel um, we are a little bit lacking um, on Tuesday night. We didn't really play with as much width as you'd like. Whereas a lot of times where Callum Kennedy and George Franklin were coming very much inside, probably to get the ball. Um, Jake Reeves, again, I thought had an outstanding game, but we just can't get him into the areas that we really need him to influence. Um, and whilst Neil Arley was brave by giving Christian Tunga his first league start, you have to wonder whether it would have been also you know, wise to maybe put him in there as a three midfielders with Danny Bullman and Jake Reeves, just to add that 
looked at pace. Wickham, he didn't get much of the ball or be able to influence the game. But you surely felt last night that he would have added that little bit of pace. So, um, yeah, I think Neil stuck with the the old guard as, as such. I think you could say, um, in hindsight, it didn't work. But we didn't play to the standards that we need to to be disposing of teams of Dagenham. You mentioned not playing to the standard that we can do, and you've already mentioned about Akin Fenwar and not being hit in the form he did last season. Is Akin Fenwar on the? Is he likely to leave in January? Is that on the cards? Well, amongst the circles that we hang around in, there's a talk of people thinking that we should we should look to to cash in. It's probably no secret that Bayer is probably one of our top earners. Um, and I wouldn't say he particularly looks like he's enjoying his football at the moment. And I, I understand that because he's not getting, he's not starting, um, he's not playing to the standards he sets, even though by his own admission he doesn't, he's been in the game long enough to not get too disheartened by that. But you have to look, I think Lara Taylor has probably taken over that lead forward role. You now would probably, if you were say, if you were to say, what striker would you want to start every game? I think the majority of fans would hold their hands up and go Lyle Taylor. Um, I wouldn't say Bayo is a natural partner to them. I think they seem to play too far apart. And um, the interesting thing, like, um, interesting on Tuesday night was, you know, last season people were calling for Aziz to just be subbed. Now they can't wait for him to get off the bench. So Aziz is winning over quite a few Wimbledon fans. And I think um, me personally. I loved Bayer last year. I wouldn't hear anything, a bad word against Bayer last year, but I just don't believe we're getting the value for what we are um, investing in him. I think we we should be looking at him in the transfer window. Your star of the week then over the two games? Yeah, so it's a challenging one. Um, I wouldn't say, obviously, we we only scored one goal. We got a one point in the end, but um, my star of the week is Jonathan Meads. I personally think he's turning out to be an excellent left-back now and... um, Stood up well to challenge a Wickham, gave him, didn't mean, didn't muck around, stood up to the physical side of it. Um, and I thought on Tuesday night, he really started to to push forward, took players on, comfortable. Um, Jonathan Meads is reco- quickly becoming one of my favourites, along with, with Jake Reeves this season. So, no, Jonathan Meads for me um, was outstanding and um, deserved a bit better from what he got in the end. A villain of the week, and it... Maybe not so much a Wimbledon player. <laughs> Maybe can I chuck in the Wickham team that can't seem to stay on their feet? Yeah, I would just chuck in the whole Wickham setup, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't the fans with drums and flares. It probably does. And flares, interestingly, um, it's good to see that we made sure we checked everyone's bag before they yeah, come extra in. Extra security. Yeah, extra security. Uh, it's difficult, don't worry. It's difficult to make sure no one brings stuff in. But I do find flares very funny when you've got a You've got a John Smith stand that holds probably not much and you chuck a flare in there. I just think it's quite funny, personally. Um, it looks good in a big stand, doesn't it? But it doesn't look so good in a, in a small John Smith's. But, yeah. Just um, like someone set a bin on fire or something. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Villain-wise, do you know what? We've, we've said all along about Gareth Ainsworth and um, his connections with Wimbledon. And he, he bigs us up and he, he does speak well of us. But I... How Neil Ali um, keeps his composure because they're, they're good friends off the pitch and that's good, but he did make some interesting remarks to Neil Ali of how they play. But um, Gareth Ainsworth and his number two, who I'm not too sure who it is, remind me very much of um, our old friend Crawley, Steve Evans, and mm. um, his number two, Blimey. always in, always in the face, jumping up and down, gesturing. It was no surprise that a linesman, um, or sorry, line assistant now, they call referee assistant, sorry. Line assistant. A line assistant, yeah, referee assistant, that would be a word. It was no surprise in the second half after having ear roll ache of Gareth Ainsworth and his number two that he, fought, he just started giving decisions, decisions, decisions for Wickham. And I just, I don't like it. I think, um, I think personally, Gareth Ainsworth should be better than that. And um, I was over impressed, and I'm a lot of love lost. And I was a big Gareth Ainsworth fan when he was at women in Premiership days, but I'm not a too much of a fan of his antics on the touchline. No, I think we were all massive fans of Gareth Ainsworth for the way he played, and the way he was as a player doesn't fit at all with the um, antics of his playing staff. I think that's fair to say. Quick little search: Richard Dobson is apparently the assistant manager of Wickham Wanderers at the moment. Really? No idea. 
Okay. Hmm. Hmm. It, um, must be an interesting link of how they're number two, or maybe it was at Wickham before, maybe. Possibly. Who knows? Anyway, moving on. That Wickham game was noticeable, or it was noticeable during that game, just how the temperature suddenly plummeted. By far and away, our coldest game of the season so far, and probably will be. I can't imagine it will get any colder, even in sort of the deepest sort of December and February time. <clears throat> February does tend to be the month where, for whatever reason, it seems to get its coldest. Reminded me of a few games in the past where my I have not been able to feel my toes after about 20 minutes, no matter how many pairs of socks I wear or what type of socks or what type of shoes or how many layers I've got on. We remember Hawley very, very well, Stuart. Hawley Town away in uh, Christmas time in the CCL. Any other games that you felt as chilly as you did on Saturday? Um, that's, yeah, I think if we remember properly, that game at Hawley was just unbelievable, wasn't it? There was nothing to stop them. To be fair, I've, had, I've been a few times to Merstrom for the under-21s recently, and that ground, I, I, I'd want to go down on a day when I'm not freezing my proverbials off, because that ground is proper cold. And you will hear me moaning over the next three weeks, by the way, because I will be at the under-21s games that they have for the next three weeks. But that place is the coldest place on earth. Um, cold places, hardly pulled this season. Sorry, Hartlepool last, last season. season. yeah. That's for a cold. Yeah, Everyone is cold. Not, everyone's been a Hartlepool, not been a Hartlepool. Get along there, right in the North Sea. It is cold. Um, yeah, so anyone who's been to Hartlepool um, will realise it's right in the North Sea. It is probably the coldest place on the earth, and I just couldn't get warm at all um, that, even, that afternoon, Nick, wasn't it? It was freezing. That wind whipping around the stadium was making it very, very chilly indeed. And that was inside a stadium. And it was freezing. There have been times, like we say, Hawley Town, for instance, where there's nothing surrounding you, just fields. Chesington and Hook, similarly, in a February. Dorking, I don't know if you did Dorking, that was ridiculous. That was the game that didn't end either. I think there was about 25 minutes of extra time added. <laughs> and it just, nobody there could stand still. They were just trying to get any movement they could to get the blood moving to their extremities to actually keep some warmth in. There is a guy also that reminds me, I've just been looking back through the records, I can't quite remember actually what year it was, but it was a game that we had at the Reebok Stadium, we, uh, it was a cup game um, against Bolton, it was midweek, it was probably the most boring game, and I, I maybe may be playing tricks on me, but I believe it, it, was a, it went into extra time, and um, Peter Beardsley was playing for Bolton Wanderers, it was probably a die game, I think it was nil nil, most positive it was, went to extra time. I remember it being cold because I remember my mate Nick, um, not you, obviously not, not Nick, Nick, your Nick, um, um, our, our friend Nick Palmer, who I will name and shame, um, decided that he would be a proper fan and leave his coat on the coach that we'd got up there. Didn't realise it was proper freezing up there and he ended up buying hot drink after hot drink after hot drink just to stay warm. Um, and I found it funny they went into extra time because it made him even colder. Um, and then to top it off, I think extra time started, and I think if I remember probably Peter Beers, he scored within a couple of minutes, and we're all just sitting there thinking, could you have done that a bit earlier? We could have got on the coach and got home, but that night was cold up there. I remember that story very, very well. I wasn't there. But I've been told that story many times up at Bolton. Very, very cold. I'm just trying to think. There was one other away game, Norwich, I think I'm thinking of, around Christmas time, where it snowed um, during the game, and we were walking home, having snowball fights in the snow. That was a chilly one. That was a cold one. And you just reminded me, actually, yeah, um, talk about snowball fights. Um, Newcastle away, um, many, many years ago, we lost 2-1 up at Newcastle. It was when we had a a late equaliser um Ruled out. I can't remember now. I remember we we travelled up on the we travelled up the motorway. We got there late. We tried to we did a, a the coach phoned the ground to try and say that we there was a coach for the Wimbledon fans who were not going to make it for kickoff. Um, we literally got into Newcastle. Uh, Newcastle, because the ground's right in the centre of the of the city, we went over this bridge. I don't think it was the main bridge there. I don't know. Of the time bridge, I forget what, what he called it. Um, but you can see the floodlights in the background. The game has started. We were listening to the radio um, and listening to the teams coming out, which was a bit of a nightmare after we just travelled eight hours to go up to Newcastle. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the game finished, I think, 2 1. We lost, and then we had probably the best snowball fight we've ever had at a service station. We stopped at a service station, 
Um, I think we had about a 25 a side snowball fight. Nice. Um, and got totally wet and then ended up... <laughs> yeah, we got totally soaked, got back in the coach to warm off, and all you could see was the aisle full of water where people had just started to melt um, from the snow. But... Um, it was a it was a night it was a, the famous night it was when uh, Eric Cantona decided oh, to yes. join the crowd at Paris. Uh, Paris and um, attack. The days before internet um, and phones. Well, sorry, there was phones, but days before internet access and mobile phone and social media, um, we listened to it on the radio about how bad it was. We didn't think it was that bad, and we got back for the first edition of the Sun. And it was on the front page, and it was. Um, it's interesting. With social media now, we we rely on it. So, so very quick information and pictures. But back then, like I say, the first picture I saw was the first edition of the Sun that we got. And um, yeah, Eric Kalmar, um like I say, decided to mingle with the Palace faithful. Did the headline on the Sun say something like one in five Brits think Palace one or one in five Frenchmen think Crystal Palace fans are idiots or something ridiculous like that the Sun <laughs> come out with making I no remember. reference to any front pages at the moment. No, I can't remember I can't remember what the headline was. It'd be interesting to see um, to remember what the headline was. But um, of course back then that was um, that was unheard of of um, players joining the crowd, wasn't it? It was indeed. We have seen it a few times over the years. But that was the first instance and not particularly pleasant one. There was, there was, you know, what one always reminds me not joining the crowd so much, but it was Jamie Carragher throwing the pound coin back into the Arsenal fans. Now that, <laughs> that always stays with me because I just thought, do you know what? Fair, fair play. On two counts: one to see a scout of throwaway money, you never see that. But also, <laughs> do you know what? If you're going to throw a coin at a player, do you know what? You can have it back. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but there we go. Goalkeeping errors. Our next topic, following on from Tuesday night, the shocker. And it was a shocker. Ben Wilson's done a good job since he's joined us. He made a mistake against York, but ignoring that, his kicking's been fantastic. His awareness, his penalty, he gets, he reads the game, he's always on the move, sniffs out any danger. Very competent goalkeeper. Howler and a half on Tuesday. Any other famous goalkeeping errors you particularly come to mind when we watch that one back? Obviously, Seb Brown against Coventry was the first one that comes to mind. I think there's a few. I think one of the ones, um, I say fair as well, I think one of the ones that I actually, I'm going to put a bit of a slant on this story, one of the ones that I've actually been, was pleased that a women and goalkeeper made a goalkeeping horror, <laughs> horror, howler, sorry, <laughs> was, yeah. um, was an afternoon at Goodison Park, um, Wimbledon 2 0 up, and um, obviously Everton needed to win to stay in the Premier League, I believe, at that time. Um, it's probably one of the probably one of the afternoons where I've probably been the most fearful for my safety, um, especially at two 0 up at Goodison Park. I've never known a crowd to really, um, yeah, to turn all of a sudden. And um, Hans Segers decided to. Um, he had a. Um, I think it was was it Barry Horn, wasn't it, who scored the, the winner? I believe. I'm not sure. I think it might have been Graham Stewart. Ah, it was actually Graham Stewart. That was close, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, Did Graham Stewart score the other one, didn't he? That's right. The one thing that one um, Seagers dive for it went over his arm, and then the one where Seagers decided to do the most spectacular dive as um, as Seagers would. Um, we let the ball in, and I must admit it was great because we had parked with your brother Chris in Stanley Park, um, and all the time whilst we were turning up, me and Chris were trying to work out how we were going to get back to our car in one piece. Um, and thankfully, as soon as Hans Seagers decided to wave goodbye to balls into the net. The gangway opened up and we were able to go back and get into our car. And driveway and safety is all the Everton fans probably ran on the pitch, if I remember correctly. Yes, I did see it on TV, but we were out of there as soon as the third goal was on. As soon as the third goal was on, we were out of there. And, um, but yeah, so that's where one of the famous ones sticks to my mind, definitely. Sagers, of course, did the famous Liverpool punch into his own net. Not too dissimilar, actually, from Wilson's on Tuesday night in sort of the way, it, the way he sort of flapped at it and it ended up in the back of the net. He redeemed himself that evening, of course, with the penalty save, and Neil Lardy went on to score the winning penalty, I think. Is that correct? He did. Yeah, that game I remember very well, because actually um, I remember leaving early. Um, I remember we were in the... I always forget... How, how long do we share Palace for? And I always forget what the ends are called. But I will see you. The end, the end now has got to the, the 2 ten where the, the, Palace fan, the Palace fans now... The when that was Road. The Homes Road Road, when that was terracing. I remember I was in the... If you're looking at the goal, I was in the right-hand paddock 
um, right at the back. And I remember thinking, right, do you know what? Game's over. We're gonna we're gonna leave. And then I literally got. I was walking literally down a hill, and I could hear people go, "Oh, well, something's happening." And then realised that I'd better get back in. <laughs> um, I think it's only one of the only times I think I actually even thought about leaving early um, from a game. Um, I don't even actually remember why I did think about that, but. Yeah, I remember that game very well. And it was also on TV, wasn't it? The highlights were on TV. Yeah. Um, was that the night we did the famous Dan Buster celebration as well? Indeed, yeah, it was, yeah. It was brilliant, that was. Back in the days when we couldn't play in our home kit in cup games because they were too similar to the... The dark blue was too dark and too similar to the referee's black. So we actually had to change from our home kits. Now, I'll tell you what, Stu, if that was still happening today, <laughs> well, you can imagine my reaction... But that was a nice white kit, though, wasn't it? That kit yeah, we actually yeah. had that year was a really... So I didn't really mind it watching. That was the day before we had change kits and European kits and, uh, I don't know, Saturday, November the 8th kits. Just yeah, exactly, any excuse yeah. to have a kit, wasn't it, it, really? Day kits, live on Sky <laughs> kits, EBC kits. <laughs> the list is endless. The list is endless. Wimbledon goalkeeping errors, I must admit, I can't think of too many off the top of my head. I remember... As we were sort of mentioning before, Merstham in the CCL, was it Tony Smith, the goalkeeper at the time? Sort of drop, dropping, catching the ball from across and just falling to the ground and dropping it right in front of the Merstham player. And he went on to score into an empty net. Andy Bell, who was our first competitive goalkeeper in the CCL days, had a bit of a reputation for some mistakes, shall we say. He didn't last particularly long. I think the thing, the funny thing is, when we go back to goalkeeping areas, especially back in the Combine Counties and the early days, um, it was very difficult to know whether they were just mistakes or, you know, all due respect to the goalkeepers we had. We went through a lot of goalkeepers, mm-hmm. didn't we? The, the the level of goalkeepers was um, was interesting, and to be fair, <laughs> that's a very nice way of putting it. Interesting. A... <laughs> it was rubbish. <laughs> it was. It wasn't good, was it? But. Also, some of the standard of keepers that faced us oh, um, was worse. funny. Yeah. And, of course, um, there's a few goalkeepers and one that was resembled to looking like me um, from Woodford Town, which was always a bit of a... It was uh, me. It was me. I don't know if it was me or not, but the poor bloke got absolute abuse. But it was always good because we could always use the the, the pie, um, yeah. chicken and mushroom song, which um, I, I miss now. Um, I think the last time we used it was for the South End... Physio, I've <laughs> seen the South and Physio bless his bit on the um, the large side, but I do like the chicken and mushroom song, and um, I'm, I'm ashamed. It's a shame that we can't sing it anymore because, to be fair, they're all very professional now, and no one's really that overweight, are they? That we, it that we face always comes down to food, doesn't it, Stu? I think it did actually have an airing at Luton in the hilarious Steve McNulty. We're going to give him abuse for being overly large <laughs> when he's up against that in Fenwar. And That's similarly, right. Luton fans giving it the same to back in Fenwell, despite having McNulty, although they do call him Sumo at Luton, to be fair. Well, they did. He's left now, hasn't he? Has he's he gone. left now? Yeah, I think he's opened a chippy somewhere. I don't know. He has left. He's gone somewhere. I can't remember where. So obviously missed him on Tuesday night after their 4-3 um, four, four, defeat, what is it? Um, I didn't pay. Uh, I, didn't, I don't know. Did they lose, did they? <laughs> they went 3-1 <three>, up <laughs> and throw it away, did they? That would be ridiculous. Well, Let's just say the women are faithful again on the back of Neil Hardy after one defeat. Luton are not putting up any any trees, are they, at the moment with L- their form? Luton and Cambridge, considering the budgets and what they've been doing, no, they should be performing a lot better. But there we go. Football is a funny old game, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah, Mansfield is still right up in the playoff places. I mean, come on. That shows you how ridiculous it is. Saying that, I noticed they lost to Exeter um, on Tuesday night which I found quite comforting, actually, because Mansfield versus Exeter, to me, sounds like a proper Division 3, bottom-of-the-football-league type fixture. That just screams that to me. There were some, there were some interesting um, results to be found on Tuesday night, which is probably symbolic of the fact that, you know, having these midweek fixtures, so we had quite a lot of midweek fixtures, haven't we, Jeremy? Quite a few games this month. Um, there was a lot of goals um, around, and... Um, yeah, not so, and also loads of goals at Portsmouth. And for anyone who sees, anyone watching the highlights wants to see a, a dead cert sending off and a shocking elbow, watch the, watch, the, watch the York sending off it. So I don't know if you've seen it, but it's some hell of an elbow. Up. I have seen it because it's Jonathan Greening who I thought that can't be the same one that was at Manchester United, but it is. It's the same Jonathan Greening with the same ridiculous moustache and beard. 
It's a, shock, it's a shocker, isn't it? It's a poor one, but <laughs> the York players weren't having it, were they? They were <laughs> they were surrounding the ref when that red card came out, moaning about it. They probably knew what was coming and just sort of said, ref, give us a favour, don't send him off. And um, yeah, they went in episode six, but yeah, York... Yeah, York, are, York, them, York are a poor side, but equally, I wouldn't say that Pompey are a great side either. I don't see we 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 started them, didn't we? But they can score goals, but um, I they've got a lot of work to do yet. Pompey, they do. York City are going to feature in our next little um, discussion about best and worst away fans that we've experienced in our time, and I'll tell you for why. Conference in our first season in the conference, York came down to us around November time. They were pushing for the playoffs. These were in the days of when they had Michael Rankin and Richard Brody and stuff like that. York brought down a good number of fans. I was I was actually really surprised and impressed by how many they brought down. They packed out the Kingston Road end as it was in the time before it was seated. And they created a great atmosphere behind the goal. So a random one to start with. But during your experience, who are the best and worst away fans that you think have visited Kings Meadow? And I'll just throw in now, we sort of decided to mention this because Wickham fans on Saturday, I'm sorry, Drummers and flares, just and that annoying chant where there's no actual words. They just make, they just start humming a tune to no lyrics. It's terrible. They irritated me immensely. Wickham on Saturday. Who have been some of the better ones you've experienced? Um, some of the better ones. It's interesting. We've had, we've had a few London derbies, don't we? I've always enjoyed when the Crawleys have come to our place and and Lutons and the big sort of teams. Um, I've always been impressed with, in terms of Plymouth, I've always bought a very good mm-hmm. um, good following. Um, a lot of the Northern clubs um, have bought. I wouldn't say there's anyone that particularly stands out. There's a lot of annoying ones. A lot of annoying um, ones. I think I could go through the annoying ones and we could probably go through them quite easily. Um, but yeah, I'd say, I, I always do think in terms of the Plymouth of this world and, and Hartlepool, um, Hartlepool have always bought a good, a good number, but I think a lot of the northern clubs are always supported well by London based groups, aren't they? Yeah, um, and to be fair, if you've been to Hartlepool, you'd understand why you want to live in London. I'm only kidding, um, but yeah, so there's always been some good ones. But the most annoying ones, can I just say, Steenish Town? <laughs> Sorry, Steenish Town, that's going back, it's Stevenish Borough, Stevenish, Stevenish FC, they Stevenish are called FC, now, yeah, <laughs> and they were the first ones that came to my head, my word. Yeah, annoying fans just because they got that horrible, stupid song, and which most teams are, are, are now copying. And please, yeah. may I say one thing? If we ever copy that song, I will just not, well, I don't know what I'll do, but I will not be enjoying and joining in. No, I don't think our fans will pick up any of those irritating songs where it's just a drum beat to people sort of chanting along or making noise. It's very irritating. I think Huddersfield actually invented those songs and they spread. So, Huddersfield fans, if you're listening, I know we have a big proportion of Hollywood fans listening to this AFC Wimbledon show. <laughs> Stop. Yeah, thanks for that. Cheers. Back in the old the old days when we were visited by a lot of bigger clubs than Stevenage. <laughs> Sorry, what am I saying? Every club is bigger than Stevenage. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, Leeds fans, I must say, always left a bit of a mark on me. I thought they always travelled well in numbers and always made a lot of noise whenever they visited us. Visited us. So I was yeah. impressed with them. New clubs, okay. similarly. I think Newcastle, yeah. I think Newcastle would be my pick. Um, I always felt Newcastle, they never had a good side, did they? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, they, the Geordies are great, great entertainment. Um, I think in terms of, we can, in terms of we're doing away fans and yeah, Newcastle, I've been to, you know, you and I have been to quite a lot of the league grounds and, um, Newcastle fans are just great. The only bad thing is, is I remember being in Newcastle, going into a pub, and a Newcastle fan talking to me. And I must admit, I just wish there were subtitles because I could understand a word he was saying. But I've they had some are, very embarrassing moments in Newcastle. But they are great fans, and um, yeah, they were probably. If I was looking at going through the years, I would say Newcastle, just great because they. Like I say they had nothing to cheer on. Um, they were always a positive. And, um, yeah, Leeds, again, Leeds, a big city club. I um, always felt Leeds had a bit of a chip on their shoulder, um, thinking they were one of the big clubs. Remind me of Tottenham fans. Tottenham, yeah. Um, we, were, we were a big club. You were a big club. Um, but, yeah, no, Newcastle would be my, would my, be my pick. Ash United, of course. Hartley Whitney. They've brought some great followings out to Kings Meadow in the past. We've just gone from Newcastle, Nick, <laughs> to Ash United. I love that link. I don't even think there is a link there. 
I just, oh, but I went for it. Um, Harlow Town were in the paper the other day because they were referencing their air raid siren, which we went, we've been to Harlow Town when we went there once a few seasons ago. Yeah. Irritating. Nice little ground, to be fair, as well, if I'm not sure. It was, it, was a new, it was a new ground, wasn't it? And they sort of, yeah, it was. It was decent, yeah. And Luton, of course, always fun when Luton come down to Kingsman Oak because they'll always make noise and they'll always cause aggro as well. And I think, just as we wrap it up, I think we also have to remember, and I miss these, and I wish sometimes they had become a big, uh, a bigger club than what they were. Well, they always thought they were a big club, but Chelmsford. Chelmsford, yeah. Uh, the, the run-ins we had with Chelmsford um, and going to their place... Um, I always felt they always felt they had a chip on their shoulder. They always um, they were inv- at that time they were investing money, weren't they? Some, some serious money was being invested. If I, remember, if I remember back, it was Jeff King who was had a lot of yeah. um, links with the, sort of that league, putting money in, and he was there. And there was always there was that rivalry which um, I loved. We, I, I think we had two big on the ways up through the leagues. We had two big real sort of rivalries: Waddingford Town. Um, <laughs> who, again, travelled well. Um, I remember going to their place. Um, we'll never forget going to Wallingford. No, Wallingford was an experience. And, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was nice, it was nice for a local police to join us to support us as well, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, such numbers as well. <laughs> such numbers. And I even wanted to get a better view and bring a helicopter in as yeah. well. Um, but Chelsford, I do miss it. I do miss it. It felt like it was a club that was... Um, wanting to, you know, were able to beat us, were very challenging for a while. And... Um, I remember beating them at Kings Meadow. Uh, I think we we, we beat that three yeah. one. Um, we beat them, and it was just that finally putting away a noisy. I weren't a neighbour, but they were just noisy people in that league. But I do miss them. I do miss them. I wish they would. Um, yeah, I wish they would get up the leagues, and uh, we had some good times against them. Sometimes we mention we've dropped in a few sort of non-league names today, remembering trips to Hawley and Dorking and. Ash United and Hartley Whitney, and there sometimes you do get a little bit glassy eyed and think, oh, well, do you know what? It was, quite, it was fun in those days. I'm not sure I would go back, but I wouldn't mind to relive it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's a one time only, but yeah. um, I, always, I always said to people that when we got into the League Two, um, when we had those days when we were struggling, I always say to them, just remember you know, what it was like. I mean, we, we had some really good times, but would you want to go back there? No. So it made us you know, fight harder. And I think it always made you appreciate actually what lead to because I think sometimes now I think we've said it before um, I think I'm not saying all fans but some fans are a bit you know we're stagnated at lead to it ain't a bad level from where you know we've we've travelled a long way in a short time and um, yeah we've done well to get to lead to we have and next up in lead two for us is Leighton Orient on Saturday I hope we've got a ticket yet yeah, I haven't checked hopefully we do because we could be in trouble if we don't. Yeah, I hear the sales are going very well for Leighton Orient. Yes, which is good to hear. And to be honest, if we do sell out the away end, I'm not sure if we will, but even if we do, that ground is not going to sell out. <laughs> if you have to end up in the home end, you'll end up in the home end. It won't be a problem. But anyway, Stu, what, what are you expecting from this Saturday? I don't know what to expect from us. I remember, can I actually, before I say that actually, I do kind of have this thing in my head. I remember a few years ago, and this is going back to the non-league days as well, we had a shocker of a result, and I'll have a look for it now. I can't remember exactly who it was. We had a shocker of the result, and then the next game was a really, really difficult fixture away at Fisher Athletic, who at the time had spent about, for every fan they had, they seemed to have spent about a million pounds okay, on their squad. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Um, and we turned them over. We went there and we won 1-0. Wes Daly scored a cracking goal from 20 yards. Yes. That's it has that sort of feel for me. Coming off a bad result against Dagenham, we can turn it round when we don't expect to. What do you reckon? Yeah, it's a totally different game, isn't it? We're going, we're going into playing Dagenham Redbridge, who were getting behind a ball, and we've got Leighton Oyen, who at home will be we're coming out, you know, be coming to attack us, and they've got an expectant um, fan base, and they 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 got a decent budget. They've done well in League One. Um, they were pushing for the championship, weren't they? So for them to be in League Two, they they haven't they haven't really started too well. As to be fair. Um, looking through their stats, it's interesting, really. They seem to score, from looking at stats, they score more goals in the second half, so I suppose you need to be wary after half-time. Um, but they actually concede most goals in the first half. I saw Gary Sachs before me, you know, didn't I, with stat-based information. But um, I've got a feeling we're, I've got a feeling we're going to do all right there. I, I really do. It'll be, it'll be nice to, to go and see Sammy Moore, who's now a regular for Leighton Orient. Um, 
I would have been, if you told me that in the summer, I would have been surprised. I thought he was going there as a squad player. Um, but he's a regular now. It'd be nice to, to see Sammy. Um, they've got a decent team. Um, but I'm expecting us to go there and put some wrongs to right after the week we've had. Because I don't think we've had the greatest of weeks performance-wise. And um, I'm going to go for a win. But, you know, I'm, like, I'm always optimistic at this stage of the season. I do think it does. It is the sort of game that suits us the way we set up, though, where we can keep, like Portsmouth, we can keep it tight, like Luton, where we shouldn't really have lost. We set up really well. We keep our shape very, very well. And we've got players that can, on the counter, exploit spaces in behind. And I'm going to say we're going to go there and get a 1-0 win. I'll settle for that. And just to, um, after the disappointment this week, I thought I just wanted to look at a stage 19 games in, and where we were last year. Do you know what? We are we are three points better off than last season at the same point. So it's not all that bad. It's not all that bad, Stu, but do you know what? Social media is pretty... I love also, by the way, when we say social media, we mean Facebook and Twitter. But the reaction... Can I just say, actually, I'm going to have a whinge, because I know you've said that, and you're quite right to say that. I am going to have a bit of a moan at some of our fans, right? Did we win three in a row? And then got a great point at Portsmouth, did we not? We did. And then got showed a lot of character to get a late equalise against Wickham in a game where the referee was pretty much against us and the Wickham players, we couldn't tackle because they break well appear to break their legs every time we touch them. <laughs> These great performances that we had over that run of time, not one mention on Facebook or Twitter. Not one. There was no, oh, Neil Lardy got his tactics right. We played really well. Aziz is looking really good. Taylor's looking great. Rees is outstanding. There was nothing. One defeat against Dagenham and Redbridge, as poor as it admittedly was, and I'd, I'd suddenly we sprouted 3,000 fans that all want to have a moan at the same time. <laughs> Can we just please just let's have a bit of balance, all right? We're a mid-table at the moment. Well, we're pushing towards the playoffs, actually. But we're, we're, we're up one week, we're down the next. But the ups with our fans seem to be like, well, this is what we should be doing. And our downs are just like the worst thing that's ever happened. It was... Um, obviously, we've had a chance to cool down and reflect. But it was... Um, we we said it, yeah. We 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 stand in the Kenflo in the Kenflo stand, and we were we were quite okay. We'd done the subs. People were like, yeah, let's get subs on it. I think it was a case of at Dagenham. It was like, I think the fans expected as a team did, as if the goal would come, the goal would come. And as soon as the goal went in, it was everyone who could look in, everyone who had hindsight was literally moaning about everything. I think, do you know what? Football is a passionate game, and. Um, it's why we go. It's why we go. If it wasn't passionate, I think we'd all find something else to do. But I think we 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 have some we have some fans at the moment, and I may be wrong, but I don't think I am. I think it's it's getting to a stage where if it, it's it's waiting for someone, it's waiting for a defeat just to have a moan at RB. Because the first of the first people that I was moaning about on Tuesday night was the goalkeeper, was the error, was the tempo. The players who had chances and didn't have a shot, the players who weren't brave enough to take on the player. The players, New Ardy puts the team out, granted, and I don't think Bayer should have started, but, but Ardy isn't, isn't responsible for a freak error. And if we're going to be moaning, we should be moaning at the players. Let's not get the players off the bat, you know. Um, we're, in, we're in as a team, we win together, we lose together. Ardy doesn't become a bad manager after one mistake. Very, very well said. Can I also add to that as well? Don't forget, we were in Dagenham's position a few years ago where we were going away to teams and we were bottom of the league. And we were going there because we needed to win games to stay up. So think about those teams that we beat. We go away to a Rochdale and win 1-0, sneak a 1-0. We go to a Torquay and win a 3-2. Do you know what I mean? Teams at the bottom of the league, they win games as well. It happens. It's football. <laughs> All right? But I suppose actually before we, before we sign off, we actually need to go through what we're going to be doing this Saturday. Uh, we do. We're going to Leighton Orient. <laughs> well, we hope we go to Leighton Orient. We hope we go. Well, we'll, we'll be going. We've got a ticket. <laughs> no what end we'll be in. If we're in the away end, yes, we shall be... Well, we might be speaking to some of our listeners. Oh, tell them more. Um, we might be speaking to some of our listeners <laughs> for the podcast. Yeah, so Stu and I, we're going to take... We're going to have our sort of mobile recording footage, footage equipment with us to Leighton Orient on Saturday, and we're going to try and speak to a few of our fans prior to the game at Leighton Orient, get their opinion on where the club is, where the first team is, maybe ask a few questions of Leighton Orient as well, and then air them on next week's show. So if you are about, look out for 
Stu and myself will be walking around, speaking to a few fans, phones at the ready, recording what they've got to say. And if you'd like to be involved, give us a shout. Tweet us at 9YIS Podcast. If you're interested in being on the podcast next week and can get uh, at Leighton Orient, can get into the ground maybe about an hour or 45 minutes before kickoff to meet us, give us a tweet at 9YIS Podcast and we'll get you on the show. And we'll follow you on Twitter as well. And for that price, we'd expect you to follow us back as well if you don't already. Yeah, basically put your makeup on and put your best frocks on. We'll be taking pictures um, and actually for ladies. Um, no, we were. We're, Stu, we're, we're on. The, this is the Wimbledon podcast we do. This isn't your sort of weird <laughs> grooming podcast that you do. <laughs> yeah, no. We, I think obviously we want to make sure we're, we're a fans. We're a fans club, and we do. You know, the podcast is, um, of course, the best Wimbledon podcast out there. And um, I think it'll be good. Now we're going to make sure you out there are going to. Get on, get on the podcast. Obviously, keep it clean um, as much as you can. Obviously, don't know, don't mind a bit of banter in there. But yeah, come and have your say. We're going to come around with a, a couple of questions of how we're getting on, and um, yeah, should be fun. Looking forward to it. Nick. Very much looking forward to it. You mentioned we are a fans club. I'd be glad it's because we are owned by the fans and run by the fans. And a huge thank you to those particular fans that do the hard work behind the scenes. The Don's Trust team, in particular, for making the Back in Two Ticks campaign such a success recently. Both votes, yes. Fantastic turnout. Overwhelming majority, yes to both votes. We can now sell King's Meadow and we await to hear about our application for the Greyhound Stadium, which could be less than a month away. So Christmas could indeed come early for Wimbledon events. We just want to remind you to vote in the Don's Trust board election if you have yet to do so. And this is our chance to also thank the Trust for all their support of this podcast that you're listening to, helping us to promote our show over the past few weeks via their website and with the help of the Election Steering Group and uh, Rob Crane as well on Match Day Programme team to give us a bit more attention, a bit more spotlight, increasing our listeners all the time. And it also helps just to remind everyone that we are fans ourselves. Don's Trust is fan... With the football club, sorry, is owned and run by the fans through the Don's Trust. We are a fans club. And we're all in it together for the best interest of ASC Wimbledon. So, Don's Trust, thank you very much for your support and promoting our podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully we'll see some of you at Leighton Orient next week. In the meantime, please like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash 9YRS podcast, and on Twitter at 9YRS podcast, and the subscribe links as well on YouTube and iTunes. Get the show downloaded directly to your um, mobile device of choice, through iTunes, click that subscribe button. Before we go, Stu, you know I mentioned that Fisher Athletic game a few years ago? Yes. Well, that came on the back of a home defeat to Margate, which I remember very well because I think a certain Martin Carthy scored for us on his debut and then probably never played for us ever again. <laughs> um, but then the following week, actually, after that, we played at home to Windsor and Eton, who were struggling at the bottom of the league. I think they had Ralph Little as a tie-in to our celebrity team from earlier. I remember that, yes. And who was in attendance at that Windsor and Eton game? Do you remember who came down to watch us that day? It was billed as the Ralph Little MC Harvey celebrity battle. It was. I remember that. Was it at Soccer AM, wasn't it? Soccer AM came down that day, yeah. And yeah. Helen, who was a lot, years, a lot of years younger then. She was about ten years younger than she is now, because it was <laughs> ten years ago. Um, and we drew one all in a rubbish performance against a team near the bottom of the league because these results do happen off the back of that we went to Fisher the following week and got a fantastic victory can you remember I remember also a sad I can't I can't believe I remember these things that checking them that Windsor and Eaton game Dwayne Plummer what a name he scored for us that day feel some guts that night didn't he <laughs> Jeez, that's worse than your who was it that scored for Newport on Tuesday night Lionel John Lewis. John Lewis, he always comes out at Christmas yeah. and he's got his own little theme tune, isn't he? Brilliant. That's it, yeah. And we've said we weren't going to do puns. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, all, I, all I hope is that when Boris Becker come up, we provided him some juice um, to make sure he wasn't first. Yeah, that's all I hope. OK, listeners, bye-bye. I'm cutting Stu off now. <laughs> and um, we'll be back next week, and I can't even tell you who's going to be on the show next week. Somebody famous. Ralph Little, probably, to talk about what he's doing with his life now. Um... Thank you very much for listening. We will see you next week.